environment where the Bible teaches about the spiritual life, it's a wide area of teachings and there are many areas involved, such as, for example, the spiritual life in prayer, the spiritual life in giving, the spiritual life in many other areas. Now, but between the, uh, this Shabbat and next week, we're going to cover just two areas. And our topic this morning will be in the survey, not a detail because we won't have as much time, but at least a survey of the role of the Holy Spirit and the spiritual life. And next week we shall deal with the spiritual life and the spiritual warfare. And, um, but keep in mind that's not the totality of all the Bible teaches about the spiritual life. There's much more involved. I have to keep, my, uh, keep reminding myself to speak a bit slower than I'm used to because we're had, doing a simultaneous translation. If I speak too fast, I might be losing some uh, of the translation. I sometimes forget myself and switch to my Brooklynese and move much quicker, but I'm hoping I'll keep in memory what I want to cover. The outline you have, we're not going to cover every point. We're going to cover probably most of the outline, at least in the survey but some segments will be skipping because they're not directly relevant to what I want to cover. Let's begin then, Roman number one, the Holy Spirit's ministry of regeneration. Regeneration is the, is the work of the Holy Spirit that imparts eternal life to those of us who believe. And that is the technical name, and the more descriptive name is to be born again. So whenever any Jew or Gentile believes in the gospel, and the content of the gospel is the Messiah died for our sins, was buried and rose again, and we believe that and trust that alone for our salvation. We are immediately regenerated by the Holy Spirit. We are born again, and we enter into a unique relationship with the Lord. And uh, it is regeneration that begins the principle of the spiritual life. Spiritual life is available only to those who have been regenerated, Every generation is only for those who truly believed. So once we have received the gospel and believed it, and we are moving on, and uh, we have begun the spiritual life, moving from uh, milk to meat, and moving from immaturity to maturity. Now, with that background, let's look at Roman numeral two, the Holy Spirit's ministry in dwelling, and capital A, the indwelling of the individual believer. It has some characteristics about indwelling. The fact is that now the um, Holy Spirit indwells the believer. There's the three points on your outline that first of all, the indwelling is universal. It means that everyone who believes has the Spirit indwelling them. Indwelling belief begins immediately upon salvation. This was true only as of Acts 2. Because in the Old Testament period, from the time of Adam until the time of Acts 2, that's the whole Old Testament period essentially, the Holy Spirit indwelled some believers, but not all of them. And we know the Holy Spirit indwelled the prophets of Israel. He indwelled the two men in charge of the building of the tabernacle. It was very limited to certain people, certain believers. As a result of Messiah's death on the cross, we now are all indwelled by the Holy Spirit, and that's one of the changes that happens between before Acts 2 and after Acts 2. The second characteristic about indwelling is it's also permanent, that once he indwells us, he indwells us forever. This too is a bit different than what was true in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, again, the Holy Spirit indwelled only some believers, but not all, but then he did not necessarily indwell them permanently. And we know from um, the passage that the, um, that the Holy Spirit left, for example, Saul. And David's prayer in Psalm 51, verse 11, Psalm 51, verse 11, he prays, Take not your Holy Spirit from me. And that is a valid Old Testament prayer, but it would not be a valid New Testament prayer. Now, once the Spirit dwells us, He dwells us forever. And we don't have the experience of 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 17, 1 Samuel 16, 17, that we can, uh, the Holy Spirit can depart from us. Now he dwells us forever. <clears throat> that teaching is found in John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. John 14, 16 and 17. 
Now, the third thing about the characteristics of indwelling is that it is also distinct, meaning distinct from the new nature. When we are born of our parents, we inherit the sin nature of Adam, and we have the old man, and the old man, the old nature, is what exercises spiritual authority over us, and as unbelievers, we have no choice. Whatever we do, good or bad, it leaves God out of the planning. However, once we, have, once we are born again, the Spirit comes in to indwell us, and he also generates or regenerates our dead human spirit. But the new human spirit, the new man and the Holy Spirit are not the same thing. Our new nature can be defeated when believers sin. The Holy Spirit can never be defeated. Now, the Holy Spirit does indwell the new man. He, the Holy Spirit indwells the new nature and gives us the empowerment to have victory. Ultimately, however, we must be the one to make those choices. And so we have both the new nature and we have the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit enables the newborn human spirit to get its victory. Now, point 20, you outline the, re the responsibilities of the believer. So let the fact that he indwells us, what are our responsibilities? I mentioned two things for now. I will detail them a bit later in the outline. But one responsibility is to keep on being filled with the Spirit. Keep on being filled with the Spirit. And being Spirit-filled is a very important facet of the spiritual life. It is the filling of the Holy Spirit that enables us to move from immaturity to maturity and from milk to meat. I'll say more about that a bit later in the outline. Secondly, we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit. And that's a sin that believers are able to commit. We are not to grieve the Holy Spirit. And that too we'll discuss later when we talk about the different types of sins that can be committed by the Holy, against the Holy Spirit. Now the key scripture is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. We won't take time to read it. But in that passage, he teaches um, five basic things. First of all, there is a rejection of moral laxness or moral weakness. Being freed from the Messiah means that we're not free to commit sin. And freedom from the law does not mean we can do anything we want to. And therefore, being part of the spiritual growth, being free from the bondage of sin means we still have certain obligations and not to fall into sin again. Secondly, he points out when we focus on the body and go around working, dealing with food for the body and body for the food, while well, these things are important to sustain us, we must also keep in mind that cannot be the primary focus. Our primary focus on the body is for the body to glorify God. We must feed the body. We must go beyond the feeding of the body to make sure the body is being used for God's glory and glorify God. The third thing in this passage, especially in verses 12 to 14, is emphasizing moral purity. And because now we have been united with the Messiah, because we now have a unique relationship with the Messiah, we have a spiritual union. And therefore, we are obligated to, read, to lead a moral and pure and excellent life before the Lord. The fourth thing is to remember in verse 19, that our body is not the temple of the Holy Spirit. Whereas in the Old Testament, that God gave the Jewish people a physical temple, and, the, and God, in the form of the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory, would dwell within the Holy of Holies of the physical temple. Once Messiah died, God no longer was uh, working with the physical temple. And now every believer is indwelled by the Holy Spirit, which renders every believer a temple of God. Which is why, again, we need to remember our bodies to be used for His glory, to honor Him, and to uh, propagate Him, and not for our own self-service. The fifth thing about the um, the fifth thing about this new thing is that it implies basically three things. First of all, besides keeping the body, the body morally pure, secondly, our body is no longer our own. This body we now have belongs to God. And because it belongs to God, the third implication is we must glorify God in our bodies according to verse 20. 
Now, the, but the Holy Spirit also uh, not only indwells us as individual saints, he also indwells the local church, but I will not be dealing with this part of it because we're more focusing on individual spirituality. Let go to, let go to your next page. I will not be covering the indwelling of the universal church either. It goes a bit beyond the purpose of what I want to study in, uh, in this morning's session. Let's focus now on the next key element, Is going to be the uh, Spirit's work and Spirit of Baptism. Now, most of the most of the work that the Spirit does in uh, this age has already been done in the Old Testament, but not necessarily to the same degree. For example, indwelling was found in the Old Testament, but was not universal among all believers, nor was it necessarily permanent. What is brand new with the work of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament that begins only as of Acts 2 is the work of spirit baptism. It's important to understand what this is, what it does, and what it does not do. Now, by way of definition, spirit, the spirit baptism emphasizes our being placed into the body of the Messiah. Now, the basic meaning of the word baptism, both in Hebrew, the tefillah, um, uh, and in Greek, uh, the baptizo, has the same meaning. It means to immerse. It does not mean to sprinkle. It does not mean to pour. It means to be immersed. That's what the meaning of the word is. So that emphasizes the mode of water baptism. Only kind of acceptable baptism is what involves full immersion. That's the meaning of the word, but the meaning of the act is identification. Identification. And when, when one is baptized, he's identified either with a person and or message and or group. He's identified either with a person and or message and or group. Now, baptism, immersion, was a common Jewish practice long before it became a practice of the new assembly, the Kehillah, the Ecclesia, the church, the body, the Messiah. Now, when a Gentile converted to Judaism, for example, he would have to do several things which included immersion into water. And by means of this immersion, he was now identifying himself with um, the Jewish people and the God of Israel. And uh, there are different kinds of baptisms being practiced, but the common meaning to all baptism was simply identification identification with a message and a person and a group. And a new identification also means a break from the old identification. So example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 and 2, Paul mentions that those who went through the Jordan River were baptized unto Moses, meaning no longer identified with the slavery of Egypt. They identified with the, new, with the people Moses was bringing out of the land of Egypt. They will become the people of Israel. It's in that transition they go from peoplehood to nationhood, from being the people of Israel to become the nation of Israel. But the same token, when we are baptized by the Spirit, we are baptized to be identified with the Messiah, and especially with Messiah's body. Now, point two, the relationship of spiritual truth to uh, spiritual baptism to spiritual truth, uh, positional truth. The moment we are placed into the body of the Messiah, suddenly 33 things become true of us. This is not the place to discuss these 33 things, but they're referred to as positional truth. Positional truth. What our position is in the Messiah, what we are not because of what we are in reality, but we are because of what we are in Him. And those 33 things emphasize our position of uh, privilege, our position of authority, and uh, spells out clearly what we can do, also what we cannot do. So our special identification in the heavenlies with the Messiah is as a result of this work of spirit baptism. Let's move on to... Um, Point three, the distinctive uh, work of this age. It's important to know when spirit baptism began and what the result is. 
because in different forms of replacement theology, where they claim that the church is the true Israel, they therefore claim that the church existed already in the Old Testament. And some begin the church with Adam, others begin the church with Abraham to connect the church with the Abrahamic covenant. And therefore, God did not make his covenantal promises with real, literal, ethnic Israel. He made the covenants with spiritual Israel, which is the church. And that's why many of them do not believe God has any special future for the people of Israel and reject the concept of a final restoration of Israel and the Jewish people into the promised land. However, as we're about to see, the determine when the church really began is to determine uh, determined upon the timing of spirit baptism. Now we're going to look at, now we're going to deal with four passages and we'll see the logic. First of all, Colossians chapter 1 verse 18. Colossians 1 18 says, the church is the body of the Messiah. The church is the body of the Messiah. So the body of the Messiah is the church. The church is the body of the Messiah. That's the first point. For the second point, let's look at it to make sure we understand. And look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13 says, for by one spirit will we all baptize into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether bond or free, we're all made to drink of one spirit. The thing to notice here is this. He says, by one spirit will we all baptize into one body. No exceptions. Every believer has been baptized by the spirit and note the result of spirit baptism is not any specific spiritual gift. The result of spirit baptism is membership in the body, and the body, according to Colossians 1.18, is the church. So there is this inseparable connection between spirit baptism and the existence of the body. One cannot exist apart from the other. So if we can determine exactly when spirit baptism begins, that will tell us when the church began. So that will take us now to our third passage, which is the book of Acts, chapter 1. Acts 1. The only gospel that actually mentions the church happens to be the gospel of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 16, and once again in Matthew chapter 18. But he says about the church, he says, upon this rock I will build my church using a future tense, which shows that in Matthew 16 the church did not yet exist. If the church was already here from Adam or Abraham, then he would say, upon this rock I will continue to build the church. But that's not what he says. He says, upon this rock I will build my church using the future tense. And so the church was still future as of Matthew chapter 16. And now look at Acts chapter 1 verse 5, Acts 1 5. For John indeed baptized with water, but she shall be baptized by the Holy Spirit not many days hence. And notice again the future tense. He points out the spirit of baptism had not yet begun. It will begin not many days hence, but was, had not yet begun. And that's why the church was not even born yet as of Acts 1. Now the question is, when was Acts 1, 5 fulfilled? When did the church finally get into existence? And, and the obvious answer would be Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. And while that is the correct answer, there is one small problem here. In that, he does mention being spirit-filled in verse 4, as we shall see later this morning. Being spirit-filled is not the same as being baptized by the Spirit. So how can we be certain that spirit baptism did occur in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4? If we go to a fourth passage in Acts 11. Acts 11.
Now, in chapter 10 of the book of Acts, God sent Peter to a home of uncircumcised Gentiles, the household of Cornelius. And through Peter's testimony, they become believers and are baptized by the Spirit into the body of the Messiah. And furthermore, he stays with them, disciples them, and eats with them at the same table, which went contrary to Jewish practices of that day. A Jewish practice that many Jewish believers still followed, not yet recognizing the new program that God has inaugurated. And now in chapter 10 of Acts, for the first time, uncircumcised Gentiles entered the body of the Messiah. Because uh, Peter broke the, not the normal Jewish uh, tradition about not eating with the uncircumcised Gentiles, in chapter 11, when he comes back to Jerusalem, he's attacked by his fellow Jewish believers. And in verse 2 we read, And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You didn't to men uncircumcised and did eat with them. And that was a no-no. And so to defend his activities in chapter 10, he does two things. He first of all tells them about the special vision God gave him from heaven and how could he be disobedient to the heavenly voice. But the second defense is based upon the Acts 1-5 passage. Look at verse 15 and note the change in pronouns. As I began to speak, Holy Spirit fell on them, even as on us, at the beginning. Again, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, the them are the Gentile believers of Acts 10, even as on us, and not so the Jewish believers of the Church of Jerusalem. At the beginning, and the beginning when the Spirit fell upon the Jewish believers was in Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. And I look at verse 16, and now remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized by the Holy Spirit. And what the Peter does here is quotes what the Messiah said back in Acts 1.5. And so by connecting verses 15 and 16 together, we learn Acts 1.5 was fulfilled when the Spirit fell upon the church of Jerusalem in Acts 2 verses 1 through 4. And that's really when the church was born. That's when spirit baptism began. So by understanding the very important and distinctive feature of the church age and the spirit of baptism, the spirit of baptism is essential for the church to begin. And the spirit of baptism begins in Acts 2, and that's when the church was born. Now capital B on your outline, unity. Spirit baptism leads to two types of unity. One type we saw in that 1 Corinthians chapter 12 passage, which unites all believers, Jew, Gentile, male and female, bond and free, into one body. All believers are united. Now look at Ephesians chapter 2. Because in Ephesians we see another type of unity, a unity of Jews and Gentiles who believe. I won't take time to read the passage, but it's verses 11 through 16. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 16. And he begins pointing out that God originally had two distinctive ethnic groups, Jews and Gentiles. But the Jewish ethnic group had the advantage that God made certain covenants with them containing covenantal promises. And in verse 12, notice the word covenant is plural because God made four eternal, unconditional covenants with the Jewish people, and we call these covenants today as the Abrahamic covenant, the land covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant. And God blesses by means of these four covenants. He also points out in verses 13 through 15 that God also made another covenant which was different. And this one was not eternal but temporary, it was not unconditional, but conditional. That was the Mosaic covenant containing the 613 commandments of the Mosaic law. There were nine different purposes for the Mosaic covenant, the Mosaic law. The one he deals with here is to serve as the middle wall of partition to you Gentiles as Gentiles away from enjoying the Jewish blessings of the Jewish covenants. 
So he points out Gentiles were two things in connection with the covenants. Number one, they were strangers to the covenants. Number two, they were far off, too far away to enjoy the benefits. When the Messiah died, he says in verse 15, he broke down the middle wall of partition, the law and commandments. And for what purpose? Look at the end of verse 15. To create in himself of the two. What two? In this context, Jews and Gentiles. One new man. So two plus one equals three. There's now a third new entity. And this third new entity comprises all Jews who believe, no Gentiles who believe united into what? In verse 16, notice, into one body. And again, body in Colossians 1.18 is the church. So the wall of separation is now down, and Jewish and Gentile believers have become united into one body in the Messiah. Now, capital C, another key element of all the result of sang uh, unity is uh, sanctification. And we won't read this, but let's look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. What happens chapter 6 is based upon what he said in chapter 5, that in spite of the increase of iniquity and sin, the more sin has increased, the greater was the grace of God. And that raises the question in chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we, uh, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Since God shows more grace when there is more sin, shall we keep on sinning so God can become more gracious? And that's the wrong application of what Paul was teaching back in chapter 5. And so his answer comes in verse 2. God forbid, he who, uh, we who died to sin, how shall we any longer live therein? And that's his answer. We have been uh, freed from the authority of the sin nature, but we're not free to sin even more than we did before. And in verses 3 through 10, he gives his explanation. In this explanation, notice six things. First of all, in verse 3, that all have been baptized by the Spirit, resulting in membership in the body. Secondly, in verse 4, we have been baptized by the Spirit to live a newness of life. Not to sin more, but to sin less, to live a new kind of newness of life. Thirdly, in verse 5, there is a logical sequence. Because in water baptism, we have been identified with his death. But now also, and because we also come up out of the water, we've also been, uh, res been resurrected. So we have not only a spiritual death with him, we also have a spiritual resurrection with him. And that should be shown in the way we now live. Fourthly, in verse 6, he gives a theological explanation in that our old man has been crucified. And by crucified doesn't mean the old man is dead. It simply means he has no authority over us anymore. He's still there. And because he's still there, which is why we still sin. But he must recognize that he no longer has authority. And therefore, we have the option to obey the old man or the new man. And with the power of the Spirit, we can obey consistently the new man. And then the, the um, fifth thing is that he gives the illustration, explanation, and it's a point of the law. He that, he that died is justified from uh, sin. That's a legal issue. Once in the legal aspect, if we break the Mosaic law and pay the penalty, if we require the death penalty, once we have died by the, by the law of Moses, then, the, then that stuff fulfills what the law requires for that sin. By the same token, we have been uh, co-crucified, co-buried, and co-resurrected with the Messiah. And therefore, what was required for our sin by the law has been paid by our substitute. And by spirit baptism, we have been identified with him. And therefore, we should no longer continue sinning for that reason. And then in the sixth thing is in verses 8 through 10, he gives another sequence involving three things. First of all, if we died with the Messiah, we shall also live with him. Secondly, since he was raised from the dead, we shall be raised from the dead. 
And thirdly, there is a, a um, connection between his death and our death, his resurrection and our resurrection. At the present time, our death and resurrection is spiritual, but that spiritual death and resurrection gives us the, uh, a, uh, gives the Holy Spirit in us the power to give us empowerment to live a consistent spiritual life. And so, therefore, we have to follow what God has taught us. The responsibility spelled out in verses 11 through 14 of chapter 6, 11 through 14, four things. Our first responsibility is to reckon that what he taught in the verses 1 through 10 is true. And the word reckon means to place on the account. Reckon as being true. And once we reckon as being true, we should live like it. So negatively, we should keep on reckoning ourselves to be dead to sin. And then positively, we should be reckoning ourselves to be alive unto God in the Messiah. The second responsibility in verse 12, let not sin reign in your body. In other words, the old man is still there. The old nature is still there. But we have no obligation to obey it. And therefore, we should not allow the old man to take over control again. The third responsibility in verse 13 means that we are to continue this practice. The practice of recognizing once and for all that we have died to sin and lead a new kind of life. And our fourth responsibility in verse 14 is sin should not have dominion over us. And again, we believers have that choice. Now, capital D, the spiritual blessings involved, involve two things. First of all, the possession of blessing. And according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Ephesians 1, 3, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. So keep in mind, positionally, we already have every spiritual blessing available to us. But then, point two, the enjoyment of the blessing. The enjoyment of these blessings will be depending upon our obedience. Yes, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. That's purely positional. But to be able to experience these blessings, we must live a life of obedience. And fortunately, the Spirit is within us to enable us to do so. Let's go on to Roman numeral uh, 4. And that is the Holy Spirit's ministry of filling. The key verse to keep in mind here is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Ephesians 5, 18. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, capital A definition. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? It means to be controlled by the Spirit. If we drink too much alcohol, the alcohol controls us from within. It will lose control of our senses. By the same token, when the Holy Spirit dwells us, um, the issue, if we submit to it, then he will fill us, meaning he will take control of all that we do and also all that we think and so on. But to be controlled by the Spirit, means to, to, to be filled with the Spirit, means to be controlled by the Spirit and controlled from within. And, uh, there was, and that's the beginnings of spiritual growth right there. Now, note several things about the grammar in chapter 5, verse 18 of Ephesians. First of all, it is an imperative. It is a command. We are obligated, as believers, to submit to the control of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, it's a present tense. And the Greek present tense emphasizes continuous action. We need to keep on continuously being filled with the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, in Greek, it's a passive voice. And the passive voice means the Holy Spirit does the controlling. We have to submit to it, but he does the controlling. And then fourthly, the Holy Spirit is both the agent and the content. He does the filling, and he fills us with himself. He does the filling, the trolling, and he controls us by himself. Now the method. The basic method involved is found in John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. John 7, 37 through 39. On one hand, we must have a desire to be filled. And secondly, we must also submit. Now, here's a basic way to how to fulfill this. And filling can be done more than once. In fact, in the book of Acts, we read at least three different times the apostles were filled 
controlled, but um, in different areas of their lives. So being refilled doesn't mean we gave up control, it just means a new area needing to be filled. So once we are born again, begin to look at the principles of spiritual life, and as we grow, we recognize, first of all, that our recreational life is not under the Spirit's control, and when we submit that, we are filled. Then we continue growing, we recognize our financial life is not under His control, and we submit that, we're filled again. We continue growing and notice our marital life is not under the Spirit's control, and we submit that or filled again. And so we should be filled many times in our lives as new areas come into being. And again, being filled again does not mean we lost the previous filling. We simply found a new area that um, needs to be filled or controlled by the Spirit. It's also possible that we can take control back. And in those cases, we have to resubmit it to be filled again. So sometimes we do uh, take over control. But being refilled can sometimes mean being refilled in the same area. Often it can simply mean a new area that we discovered that we've not submitted to the Lord's control, and we submitted and filled again. So we should be filled many times as we grow spiritually. And again, it is the filling of the Spirit that enables us to move from milk to meat and from immaturity to maturity. The capital C, the command. Again, the command is a present for meaning keep on being filled. We should not assume that once we're filled, we're filled forever, and we must not simply rely on past experiences. And sometimes we gain a great victory in the spiritual warfare. We are in danger of assuming that we've made it to the top. We're not cautious and find ourselves slipping again. So we we'll have to keep in mind that the conflict we have is a lifetime conflict. We'll say more about this next week. And um, we need to remember, be conscious to keep on being filled with the Spirit continually. The capital D, the fellowship with God, it is this filling that means uh, we can have fellowship with God that the sin question has been dealt with once and for all. Now obviously, when we, if we as believers continue to live in sin, we're not being filled with the Spirit at that point of time in that part of our lives. And therefore, uh, capitally, we must keep on walking in the Spirit. And walking involves keeping the commandments He has given us. It must be careful to note the commandments he gave us, because often people fall into parts of the scriptures that were not intended for us. And so our rule of life is the law of the Messiah, the commandments given to us either by Yeshua directly or by his apostles. Um, those are the ones that are, that are intended for us uh, as of now. If we try to go back to the law of Moses, the rule of life, we'll end up actually disobeying some commandments of the law of the Messiah. And the capital F, the results of all this is also several. First of all, the primary result is to become more and more conformed to the image of the Son of God, to conform to the likeness of the Messiah. That's the goal. The Holy Spirit is focusing not on Himself, but on the Messiah. And the whole point of sanctification is to conform us more and more to the image of the Son of God. A second result is a life of service. It's as we are filled with the Spirit that we can finally serve the Lord in the spiritual capacities and gifts He's given us. Thirdly, here in Ephesians 5.19, 5.19 is going to promote worship and promote praise. The fourth result in verse 20 will promote a spirit of thanksgiving. We'll be thankful to all that God has given us. Even in negative aspects of life, we will learn how to be um, thankful to Him. So let's make some distinctives between spirit baptism and um, spirit filling. Spirit baptism is not, never commanded. You're never commanded to be, be baptized by the spirit because that's automatic the moment we believe. We are commanded to be filled because we must do the submitting to be controlled by the spirit. Secondly, for the believer, spirit baptism is a past act, a past ministry. It's a one-time event that happened when we believe, and now we are presently being filled. That's a present reality. Thirdly, spirit baptism is true of all believers the moment they believe, but filling is only among some believers, those who submit to Him. 
Fourthly, spirit baptism happens only once in the believer's life when he believes, and spirit filling can happen many times. Fifthly, spirit, spirit baptism results in union with the Messiah, and being filled um, brings communion and fellowship with the Messiah. And sixthly, spirit baptism gives us positional truth, being filled as practical, experiential truth. So that's the distinction between spirit baptism and being spirit filled. All right, let's go to Roman numeral five and let's talk briefly. I won't cover out this whole outline detail, but let's about what it means to be illuminated by the Holy Spirit. And turn to First Corinthians chapter two. Now from chapter 2, verse uh, 9, to chapter 3, verse 3, he deals with the principle of illumination, and by illumination we mean by definition, when the Holy Spirit enlightens the mind of the believer to understand spiritual truth. He enlightens the mind of the believer to understand spiritual truth. This does not involve any new revelation. The revelation we have is not complete in the Word of God. Nor does it, is it a matter of intelligence or how, uh, how high your IQ is. Spirit illumination is available to every believer. And therefore, every believer can be illuminated by the Holy Spirit to understand Scripture. And it doesn't matter how much education we have. It's a matter of how serious we are to study the Word He's given us. Now, the reason this is necessary is um, because of the blindness of the human mind that was inflicted upon us in our unsafe state by Satan. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, Satan has blinded our minds so we would not understand spiritual truths. Now what happens in this passage in 1 Corinthians 2 and 3, he, he categorizes people in four different categories insofar as their ability to understand spiritual truth. And the first category in verse 14 is the natural man. The natural man is the unsaved man who does not have the Spirit of God. So the unsaved man, as he reads the Bible, what he reads is to him foolishness. And, he can, and while he can understand some of the basic things it teaches, he cannot understand the meat of the Word of God. He cannot understand the, uh, the deep things of God because they require spiritual discernment. And without the Holy Spirit, spiritual discernment is not possible. That's the unbeliever. His, his, uh, atti his attitude towards of God is, uh, is negative, and he doesn't have the ability or capacity to understand what it really says. Now a second category in chapter 3 verse 1 is a babe in the Messiah. A babe is a newborn believer. Now when we, are, when we are born physically, we're born very immature. We cannot talk, we cannot feed ourselves, we cannot walk, we cannot say anything. And so moving from physical immaturity to physical, physical maturity takes time. The same principle applies to the spiritual rebirth. It takes time, not as much time. You expect the Corinthians to be spiritual by now for the time he began the church. The time of his letter is about three to four years. But um, as a babe in the Messiah, the babe understands the milk of the Word of God, but cannot understand the meat of the Word of God, but that's natural, nothing wrong with that. All of us here are believers, began as babes in the Messiah, and we began with the basics. It's only if we fail to grow that it becomes a problem. Now is the third category in the chapter th uh, 3, verse 1, and that is the carnal believer. The carnal believer is someone that has been saved long enough to have matured, but never bothered to mature. And that's often due to a lack of consistent Bible study, or they may have Bible study, but they fail to apply the Word of God to their lives. And therefore, the ability to understand the meat of the Word of God is no better than the unbeliever. No better than the unbeliever. The difference between the unbeliever and the carnal believer is that the carnal believer has the Spirit of God. He has the capacity to mature, has the capacity to understand, but not bother to study, to learn to do so. 
And these are the people in many congregations and churches that are uh, satisfied with the milk, the basics, never mature, never seem to understand the deep things of God, and never grow and take. And usually I call them the Sunday morning only people. And they feel they come Sunday morning, they fulfill their entire obligation to God. They have no other involvement in the local body than that. But the fourth category is what we all should strive for in verses 14 to 14. Uh, through 16, to be the spiritual man. And a spiritual man has been saved long enough to mature, and he has matured. He has matured because he has spent time in the Word of God, he has applied what he's learned to himself, and therefore has pressed on to spiritual maturity. And, um, and, that's the, and it's the, those who are spiritually mature that receive the work of illumination of the Holy Spirit. And... Um, if, if a person is uh, saved as a mature physical person, as an adult, within three or four years, you should have reached a time of spiritual maturity. If they don't, you can see they've fallen into carnality. All right, I'm gonna skip the rest. Let's move on to your last page. Let's talk about the sins against the Holy Spirit. There are two categories. First of all, sins committed by unbelievers. I will not detail these. That's not our focus this morning. One is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is a national sin of Israel for rejecting the Messiah on the basis of being demonized in Matthew chapter 12. And resisting the Holy Spirit is mentioned in Acts 7 verse 51, Acts 7 verse 51, where the unbeliever resists what the Spirit uh, uh, convicts him of. And, then, and therefore fails to believe. Let's talk about the three sins that is possible for believers to commit. First of all, grieving the Holy Spirit is mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. And grieving the Holy Spirit is when we sin and therefore uh, fall away from allowing the Spirit to fill us. Now, the context of Ephesians 4, 13 is in the context of uh, the tongue. And especially the sins of the tongue, when we speak out against others and say things which are not true. Sometimes we have to say things which are true in order to bring out the truth, but we must be careful that what we say about others is true and not untrue. And if it's untrue, we grieve the Holy Spirit. It's not the sins of the tongue is not the only way we can grieve him. That's one of the key ways we can grieve him. Now what this shows us two things. First of all, it shows the Holy Spirit is a person, not a thing. Things cannot be grieved. Personalities can be grieved. It now renders the Spirit a personality. And then um, secondly, it shows the Holy Spirit loves us because he has, because of his love for us, it grieves him when we uh, commit these kinds of sins, especially the sin of the tongue. The second sin, again, that believers can commit is called quenching the Holy Spirit. That's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, 1 Thess 5, 19. It uses the plural form to, and emphasizing this is not an individual sin, it's a congregational sin. The first sin is individual. The second one is congregational. And that's when a congregation limits a believer's use of a spiritual gift. Now Paul spells out how the gift should be used in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, and therefore we are obligated to follow those rules, but we should not add our own rules and limit believers' use of the gifts, but it must be used biblically and not humanly and not selfishly, not carnally. So by means of... Um, of, uh, of keeping believers from the use of the gifts by local congregation is uh, how this sin could be committed in this category, uh, quenching the Spirit. And then one more thing, and that is tempting the Holy Spirit, mentioned in Acts 5, verse 9. Acts 5, verse 9, in the case of Ananias and Sapphira, they lied to the Holy Spirit about how much money they were actually giving, and they were stricken dead right then and there. That's the only example we have in Scripture being slain by the Spirit, and they're dead. Because Paul, Peter says they were tempting the Holy Spirit by what they did in the class of believers. 
So these are three different kinds of sins believers could commit. But again, by, by recognizing we've been baptized by the Spirit in the body, we now have a union with the Messiah, recognizing that we can submit to the Holy Spirit and keep on being filled and controlled by the Spirit, that will keep us from being guilty of these specific sins. Next week, we'll focus on the, the conflict of the, of the spiritual conflict and the uh, spiritual life and the war against the world, the flesh, and the devil. We're going to open the floor for about 15 minutes of questions. So, To get in touch with us, you can do so by telephone, 1-888-685-5902. Locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. You can also reach us through our website at www.arielcanada.com. Again, the phone number is 1-888-685-5902 or locally in Montreal, 514-685-5902. Website address is www.arielcanada, all one word, A-R-I-E-L, Canada.com. Be blessed. Shalom.